Sophia Jones from Dear Pandemic, and I'm so sorry we're starting late this morning. We had every kind of technical issue <laughs> getting started here, but we are nonetheless ready. Um, so I'm really excited this morning because we are going to be um, taking questions from kids, and I am here with two of our Dear Pandemic contributors to take those questions, Dr. Michelle Kinder, who is an immunologist, and and Dr. Aparna Kumar, who is a, uh, she has all the degrees. She's a nurse practitioner and a PhD researcher and a psychiatric healthcare provider. So welcome, you two. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. So we are going to be taking lots of questions for kids. We got some really awesome questions and it's very exciting. But before we get started, um, both of you are moms. And so I was wondering, what's your kid's favorite book right now? I can start. So um, my son, he asked us to buy this book that he had read at school. It's called Wacky Wednesday. Aww. And on every page, just wacky things happen. And he loves us to read it and to point out all the wacky things. So that's the book of the month currently. <laughs> awesome. Aparna, how about you? So we have a, a different sort of culture here. My son is into the Dogman comic series by Dave Pilkey. A yeah. um, mm -hmm. lot of toilet humor, uh, but also a lot of laughs. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I have two sons and um, one of them really loves those, uh, those David Pilkey books too. Yeah. And he's also really into the Percy Jackson series. And my younger kid is really just, he's an early reader and um, he is way into Minecraft and he's got these like kind of early reader comics that are all about Minecraft, like Minecraft fanfic basically. So fun. Yeah, it is fun. So I wanna give a big shout out to Bridges for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing and uh, they're providing live closed captioning services. You can turn those on using a little box on Facebook as well as ASL interpretation. Um, Kat joined us a couple minutes late because she was only one of the people having technical issues this morning. <laughs> but I'm glad to see that you're here, Kat, welcome. <laughs> So thanks to Bridges for providing these services so we can get the good word out to more people. All right, so let's get started. We've got a ton of great kids questions here. And the first one I'm gonna to throw to Michelle. Greta, who's age five from Camp Hill, Pennsylvania asks, why do you need the vaccine? Uh, that is, how does it work? Right, I think this is a great question and a good one to start us off. So vaccines show your body a, a, like it's like a wanted poster. It's like, this is the bad guy. So the vaccine shows a little piece of the virus to teach your body. This is a bad guy. When you see this bad guy, you go after it because it'll make you sick. And because of the vaccine, when, if you do see the bad guy virus, your body will react and say, oh wait, we saw that before. We're going to get it before it makes us sick. And that's how vaccines can protect us. Nice. So we're going to put some links for more information in the chat box as we usually do here. And the, I found a link for this one that's a nice little um, cartoony kind of video for kids about how vaccines work. Okay, thanks, Maria. All right, next up to Aparna, mm -hmm. um, we have a question from Ariana of Olympia, Washington, who is eight years old, and she wants to know how fast does it spread and what are the easiest ways people spread it and how can you help prevent spreading COVID. And um, Ariana's parent adds, I told her she knows the answer to that last one, but she said, I want to hear a more professional opinion. <laughs> Thank you, Ariana, for trusting us. We love this question. And you know what? We ask and respond to the same questions for ourselves all the time, just to remind ourselves what the right thing is to do. So still a good question. So COVID spreads pretty quickly. And that's one of the reasons why we tell people that you don't want to hang out with other people, especially if they're, you know, you don't know what their status is for too long, and especially indoors. It spreads through droplets, right? Boogers, snot, body fluids, um, flying in the air, and then getting into your nose, mouth, or eyes. And that's what we're really trying to prevent. So when you ask about how we can pr help prevent spreading it, we can stay away from people. 
we can restrict who we're seeing, we can stay outside, we can limit our time with them. Of course, we can also wash our hands. We have for our grownups, we have a really cool phrase, which is stay smart, space, mask, air, restrict time and shots we've added to that. And for our kids, we use one in the fall and we called it s'mores. So space, mask, stay outside, repeat. I call that repeat with your friends, keep the same friends, don't switch them up too much and then have an ending time for how long you're gonna hang out with someone. That's super duper helpful. Uh, and then your last part was, um, how can you help prevent spread it? So all of those things, plus you can tell your friends. And then of course you can wash your hands and have good hygiene because you know what, that's good anyways. COVID or not, it's good to wash your hands and I'm glad we're all doing it. Definitely, all right. So next up we've got Michelle is gonna take a question from Ross who is age 11 in Highland Park, Illinois. Ross says, I'll be 12 in June. When do you think I'll get my vaccine? And when can my younger brother get one? He's nine. So we had a lot of questions about the timing of vaccines. And uh, I thought this was a good one because it, there's two different groups. So kids that are age 12 to 16, they should be available any week. There's a, um, a gov part of the government called the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, they are reviewing it currently to make sure that they agree that it's safe, that it works. And any, any day, any week, that vaccine will be available for kids 12 and older. Now for kids that are six months, so little babies, all the way to age 12, additional tests are needed. They have to decide how much to put in each shot. And once they figure out how much to put in, you know, some kids may need less vaccine than adults, um, then they'll do bigger study. So this will take a little bit longer, um, probably by the winter holidays, uh, by the end of this year, vaccines will be available for everybody from age six months all the way up. Fingers crossed. Michelle, do you think they're gonna be, is the next phase gonna be um, the age five to 12, or do you expect there to be all of the, you know, babies through 12 year olds all at one time? I, I think that's a good question. We'll have we to see. Yet. I think that they're doing things in parallel as much as they can. Yeah. Okay. And there was another question, if it'll be phased, so kids with higher, you know, risk factors would go first. No, the, the vaccine availability is much higher than it was before. So when it's available for kids, all kids, would should be able to get it. All kids who are the right age will be able to get it at once. All right, Aparna, next one for you. Levi, who is seven years old in Leadville, Colorado asks, this is such a great question. I love this one. <laughs> we live high up in the mountains, over 10,000 feet. Does the thin air make the germs not fly as easy? Airplanes and helicopters train here because it's hard to fly at altitude. Levi, I love that you know what thin air is. That's so cool. Okay, so let's let's start from what we know. So this is a cool science thinking question and we're using science to think of any, you can know any science, but you know the methods and it helps you think about things. So here, there is some evidence, right? That people who live in these altitudes maybe get COVID a little bit less, but here's what we don't know. There are lots of factors around that. People live far apart, maybe, in those places. Maybe they're not getting together as much. Or maybe there are other factors, like you said, is it this thin air? All right, then let's go to the airplanes and, and whatnot. So they why, why is it harder? It's because all the molecules are spread apart. And when you're flying, you need resistance to actually take off. So airplanes and helicopters are a little different. Actually, I don't know that much about helicopters. I will never go in one. Um, but airplanes need long, much longer runways to take off in these altitudes, right? It's, just, it's more about the takeoff and the landing than getting up in the air from what I understand. So when you have thin air, molecules are spread out. So that might tell us that, does that mean the COVID molecules in the air are more spread out? We don't know. Then there's the other thing. What is the air like when we're high up? It's typically colder and typically drier. What does that do to the virus? So there are a number of questions about it, 
But the main thing that I would emphasize, so I guess theoretically we could say, oh, maybe there are less molecules bouncing around or, oh, it looks like people get COVID less in high altitude areas. But when we really think about it and we know about how COVID spreads, most of the time, gatherings of large people and indoor settings. So either way, you wanna avoid those settings in order to decrease your risks. I looked this up too, because I thought it was such a great question. And I found this really interesting tidbit, which was that early on when we were still trying to figure out exactly how does COVID even make you sick, um, some of the high altitude uh, health experts weighed in because they recognized the set of symptoms that people who were, got really sick had as being similar to altitude sickness, because it's um, altitude mm -hmm. sickness is what happens when your body has a sudden drop in how much oxygen it has. And it looked a lot like what was happening to some of the people who got really sick with COVID-19. So mm -hmm. um, some of those high altitude uh, health experts were able to say, oh, well, this looks familiar to us. We kind of know what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's one more piece of it that we kind of is a question mark for those that want to look this one up, but we think maybe there's some change in the receptors that the virus likes to get into at high altitudes, but that's still a question mark. We need yeah. to know more about it. Yeah, so a lot of question marks, which means you've asked a great science question. If, if mm -hmm. the answer is, I don't know, then you're on the right track. <laughs> okay, next one from Michelle. Isla from... Washington Township, New Jersey, who is nine years old, would like to know, will every baby that's born, even in generations to come, have to get this vaccine? Uh, Molly, I think you just said, if it's a good question, you know, we answer, I don't know. <laughs> and this is, I don't know, maybe. I think that, you know, it could end up, so the whole world has coronavirus now. It's kind of everywhere. I think it was even in Antarctica, right? So, yeah the whole world needs to get vaccinated or exposed to coronavirus. There's likely that there's going to be little pockets of, of coronavirus just you know, still in the human population. So it may still remain a threat even after you know, we get vaccinated here and we may need to have updated vaccination. So it may end up that we become similar to the flu vaccine where we get vaccinations um, periodically or every year, <laughs> um, but that's okay. I think we are much better prepared to make vaccines. We know how to do it. We know how to make that work. So if that's the case, we can do it. Yeah. Okay, Aparna, the next one's for you. Mm -hmm. Joseph, who is age nine from Seguin, Texas asks, how can regular antibodies help to protect the human body from COVID? Actually, he has a bunch of questions. So I'm going to let's do that one first and then we'll turn to the next one. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so I was I always jump into the next one. So how can regular antibodies help to protect the human body from COVID? Okay. So our body, I so Michelle talked a little bit about this, but our body is looking for that virus and then responds to it and creates the appropriate antibodies. Michelle, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, so your body currently has, has antibodies. Antibodies are like little bits of protein that beat up bad guys, but each antibody recognizes something else. So you could have antibodies that recognize the flu bad guy. You can have antibodies that you know, when you get the vaccine, you can have antibodies that recognize the coronavirus. So each antibody, I guess, is, is different. So I'm not sure what you mean by regular, <laughs> but um, you know, antibodies can help to, to beat up different bad guys and the right antibody can beat up the coronavirus. Yeah. All right, so second part of Joseph's question. Um, can you show us a picture of COVID under a microscope and how many coronaviruses would have to be put together to be able to see it with our eyes. And I'm actually gonna screen share because I did find a picture of it under a microscope. So while you're talking, Aparna, I'll oh, cool. show my screen here. Okay. I think these pictures are so cool. It really does look like how we draw it and how we make you know, images of it. Of course, we add a little bit of color and flair, but the coronavirus is about 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 micrometers or 100 nanometers it's showing right there. So it's about 125 nanometers or 
0.125 microns. What does that mean? It means there's like nine zeros in front of the number I'm giving you. It is yeah. really- A nanometer really, is one billionth of a meter. Yeah, it's so small. It's so small. So just, just for perspective, we would need like, so your hair is 60 micrometers. Oh, this is a good one. Yeah, so you can see how big your hair is. You would need like hundreds of coronaviruses to even begin to see. And it's very unlikely we would ever be able to see that many tiny little coronaviruses together. What I do think though, is that we do, and we know that we, when you get a droplet, so coronaviruses travel and droplets into our body, you do get a bunch of little pieces in there. So it's still unlikely you would ever be able to see them, but just for a sense of a size um, there. Oh, and thank you for circling the droplet. So you can see how at least a couple little coronaviruses would get into each droplet. And you can imagine how many droplets come out when you sneeze or when you cough or blow your nose or something like that. Um, and what, and I think, yep, I think that's, yeah, that's, that's all I have for that one. <laughs> it's I'm really, really tiny. It would be, it's, you know, even compared to a dust mite, which we don't have pictured on here, a dust mite, which you also can't see is like 200 times bigger. <laughs> so um, microscopic. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for that question. Ultra microscopic. So you would need, um, I, I was looking at the picture, so you may have already <laughs> said this and I didn't hear it, but <laughs> you would need like 600 um, coronaviruses stuck together in order to, to begin to see it with your, um, without a microscope. And mm -hmm. of course we would never have 600 of them stuck together in nature so that, you know, they, they're always gonna be invisible to the naked eye. All right, next one for Michelle, we have a question from Sam from Humboldt County, California, who is nine years old. And Sam asks, is it safe to play soccer games with masks on? So I think everything we do carries a little bit of risk, right? But playing soccer, I, with a mask on outside is to me a very low risk activity. And my son plays soccer. We, we love soccer here. I think soccer has a lot of benefits. So keep playing soccer. I love soccer. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, one of the things we talk a lot about is we actually get lots of questions from adults that are similar that say, is it safe to do something, right? But um, like Michelle said, everything we do has some risks and has some benefits. And so we really like to try to reframe those questions to what can we do to make it safer, right? Rather than just, is it safe? And what we can do is, is those things that Aparna talked about earlier, which is wear masks, keep it outside, um, and so on. And I agree that I think playing soccer outside is, is pretty safe activity, even in a pandemic, as it turns out. All right, next one to Aparna. We have a question from Etta from Edgerton, Wisconsin. If the coronavirus began in a bat, why aren't the bats sick? And I want to just lead with a little detail here. We don't know for sure that, the, that this um, pandemic virus started in bats, but scientists have some pretty good clues that it did. And the main one is that the closest known relative of this virus is something that infects bats. Um, and specifically, scientists in China found a 96% match to the genetic code of another virus that they had already in their archives. And that was a virus that infects horseshoe bats. And so that's what makes us think that it probably started in bats. Okay, so I'm going to take this one. Um, oh, sorry, I apologize lady. for <laughs> the um, lawn mower in the background. This is real life. Uh, so great question. I, you know, bats can tend to carry a lot of diseases. It's just kind of how bats are, are made. They, they live in huge colonies um, in, in caves and in trees. And they also are, are very close to humans because there's so many bats and they, they live in close proximity to humans. They just, they carry a lot of diseases. Um, and bats, there's something particular about them. They get really hot when they fly. They get a hundred degrees. So it's like they have a fever whenever they're flying. Um, their heart can beat up to a thousand beats per minute. And if, if our heart did that, we'd be dead. So <laughs> they've, evolved, they've evolved, as my son says, leveled up. Um, to be able to withstand these viruses. They don't get 
sick like you and I do, their immune system, their shields can repair damage and it doesn't, it, it can fight the viruses without getting like too crazy, too overactive. Uh, so they just, they are able to live with the viruses, whereas we get the virus, we can get much sicker. I have a, um, a link that we'll, we'll put in. This will address some of those questions about the bats getting, getting sick. And I think also kind of to the next question that we have, uh, which is how did the, this is from area or um, who's age six in Iowa, how did coronavirus get from bats to people? So now is the time I get to talk about bat poop. <laughs> so <laughs> as we said, the bats can get, uh, they carry a lot of virus. They don't just carry coronavirus. They can carry other viruses that can make humans sick. And bats, they, you know, they live with a lot of other bats and they just, there's poop everywhere, right? And there's pee and there's bat spit and <laughs> all of these things can transmit virus. So um, as humans, if humans get in contact with bat poop, spit, you know, <laughs> we, we can get sick from some of these viruses. With um, the coronavirus, with this particular coronavirus, it's likely that another animal, uh, maybe a pangolin, which is a, it kind of looks cute. <laughs> uh, so can, cute. Yes. Uh, maybe got in contact with some of these fluids from a bat and it got sick. And that made the, the, uh, the virus change a little bit to make it easier to get to humans. Um, and again, it's the, the fluids, the, 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 the poop, the pee, the spit, the snot, <laughs> the boogers. Uh, that a human probably came into contact with uh, from this other animal. So that's why we wash our hands <laughs> and, and try mm -hmm. not to um, you know, get any of these materials in our, our mouth and our eyes. So Yeah, and if you've ever been to a petting zoo of any kind, you probably saw that there's a hand washing station immediately after you've been touching the animals. And this is exactly why, because um, that situation where you maybe have something nasty from an animal on your hands is, is a high risk for getting yeah. a virus. If I can add, bats are good. Bats can pollinate. That means they can, you know, help the flowers and, and help, uh, you know, fruits. Um, bats also eat mosquitoes. So bats can be very, very good. It's just, you know, stay away from bat poop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bats are great, but they're not, um, they're not great to be in they're not clean, they're dirty. It's not something you want to be close to, but something you want to be in nature. <laughs> so we have, I'm going to throw you guys a curveball and ask one more question that wasn't even on our list, okay? But I, I think you're going to know the answer to this one. Um, Charlie <laughs> from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, who's nine years old, and also another Charlie who is eight years old in Boston, would like to know, they asked the same question, will I get to see my cousins this summer? Can we be indoors and together? And in particular, this is confusing because the adults will be vaccinated, but none of the kids. So what do you think? Yeah, I would say kids are unvaccinated people, right? So you're not vaccinated and your adults that go with you may be vaccinated. So that does add a little layer of risk. But remember for yourself, as a young person, you are less likely to get sick and you are less likely to get sick sick with COVID or severe or get hospitalized for COVID. Even so, it's still important to take precautions. I say that so you're not worrying, worrying all the time because it is good to kind of know that um, you don't, maybe you don't have to worry all the time, but it is important to still remember what we're saying. Better to see people outdoors, better to have space, better to wear a mask, better to limit the amount of time you're with other people and, um, 
and then if you once available to get your shot as well. Now, one thing I can say is that, you know, last summer, our, our group talked a lot about, you know, how can I get to see people? And we talked about isolating and testing before you saw people, and then maybe having a little bubble. Remember that word? We talked about bubbles and having a group of people. So maybe if you want to see your cousins and do some of those things, you think about um, with your grownups, you think about making that type of a plan isolating from other people for a couple of weeks. So that would mean like not going to school or camp or other places. Um, and then maybe getting tested before you go and then maybe have, staying with them for a few weeks and then doing the same thing when you come back. That's what, that's what my recommendation would be if you wanna do that. In terms of seeing people outside, that's pretty safe. Um, if you're wearing a mask and doing all of those other things. Now it gets hard when you're playing and you're having fun. And it's really gonna get hard when it's summer because masks are hot as well. They felt good in the summer, in the winter time rather. And um, you know, they get hot, stinky and kind of wet in the summer. Yeah, they do get really hot. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go on to the next one here. Um, uh, sorry, I lost my document where I was reading them off of. Here it is. Okay. Um, so Ivan, who is in Worcester, is worried. He's 10 years old. He wants to know, can what is happening now in India suddenly begin to happen in the United States? So it is scary, Ivan. Thank you for asking that question. And I really, and I know we all do appreciate that you're thinking about other parts of the world because what we do influences other people and what they do influences us, right? So what can we do um, to prevent something like that? Well, first of all, you asked, can it happen? And I, I can't say, no, it'll never happen. I can't say that. But what I can say is the less contact we have other people, the less we allow the virus to transmit from one person to another, the less likely there will be variants. And variants are part of what is driving this kind of like wildfire that we're seeing where cases go up really quickly. That, and of course, there are other factors in every country um, has its own unique factors that kind of help, help or inhibit transmission of this virus. So remembering our basic rules is important not letting the virus transmit itself is important. And then just remembering that whatever happens, it's not gonna be forever and what you do does matter. So there are things you can do in your daily life. So really what you do, like if you wear your mask, if you stay away and all of those things we've been talking about this whole time, it really will make a difference. In terms of predicting, you know, are we gonna get this variant, variant or that variant? Um, it is possible, but of course, we know what to do now. You know, we have kind of a response and a plan in action. So a virus or a variant comes and we and we take the appropriate actions and then hopefully we can nip it in the bud. Okay, thanks for that. So, you know, yeah, it is really worrying. It's really scary to see what's happening out there, but um, we do what we can to keep ourselves safer. Okay, um, Michelle, I'm gonna spring another one on you. <laughs> I don't know is an acceptable answer. Kylie, who's 10 years old in Lubbock, Texas, says both of my parents got COVID and I didn't. Is there a way to test for antibodies without drawing my blood? Probably not. <laughs> it's not an I don't know, but it's, it's it, you know, antibodies live in your blood. Yeah. So they're... I don't know if there's a saliva test, a spit test maybe, but it, it would not be very available if it were. I don't think that it is. I don't think I, there I think is. the saliva test tests for actual virus. It doesn't test for antibodies. No. Antibodies mm -hmm. may break down in your saliva. So yeah, no blood. I'm just yep, gonna say no. Saliva. I'm just gonna say the antibodies no. live in your blood. They're part, they're part of your, you know, they circulate mm -hmm. along with the rest of the parts of your blood. So the answer is no. That's that's where you <laughs> can I point. just add something? Even yeah. if Kylie gets this antibody test, right? Let's say Kylie, you go ahead and get the, the blood test. Um, that isn't a hundred percent, right? That's not really telling us a hundred percent that you did or didn't have um, COVID infection at this point. Um, yeah. So it would depend you know, a little still, bit on how long ago it was, and yeah. Mm -hmm. So. It might not be worth the trouble of getting if a blood it's, test. If it's positive, it's positive. But if it's negative, it's like, well, maybe it may not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not as informative. Yeah. It's probably easier to just assume you really didn't have it 
and mm -hmm. do what you can to keep yourself safer. Okay, last question. Um, everybody had this question. It came from Annalise, who's age nine in Akeny, Iowa, and also Chase from Michigan, Rosalind from Massachusetts, Anna from Pennsylvania, Vivian from Wisconsin, Delilah from Oregon, all want to know, when's it gonna be over? I mean, before we answer that, I just want to say you guys are doing a great job. I will say kids wear masks better than adults. <laughs> so That's good true. job, really good job wearing your mask at school. If you, if you are in person or if you're doing virtual school, you are doing awesome. <laughs> I, I just want you to know that. Uh, the, the second thing is you know, my son tells me when coronavirus is over, he's never wearing his mask again. So if that's the, the gauge for, is it, are we there yet? The answer is no. <laughs> um, so we're going to have to be careful for some time. We're going to have to get the vaccine when it's available. And until then, during this time, which we're calling the panned exit, the exiting of the pandemic, we're, we're going to have to continue wearing our masks. I'm sorry, guys, if you go to camp this year, or if you go to school next year, you're, you're probably going to be wearing a mask um, and still creating some space. Um, we're still going to have to avoid very large crowds. Um, we're we're going to have to be very aware of, of the virus for, for some time. Maybe sometime next year we'll be okay, but still then there'll be other viruses like the flu or Maybe coronavirus will still be around. We just, just need to be aware that it, it's there somewhere. Do you want to add anything, um, Leah? Or yeah. yeah, I'll just add one or two things that, you know, it's hard. It's really hard to say when it's going to end because none of us can predict that. Um, we know that things are better today than they were yesterday for some of us, not everywhere in the world. Oh, Michelle's kitty is making an appearance. Hey, kitty. <laughs> uh, um, so we do know Thank that things, <laughs> things are getting better, but it's not like, um, like Jen Dowd, Dr. Jen always says, it's not like an on off switch. It's not like, okay, good night, coronavirus, see you later. Um, so it's more like slowly we'll be able to do some of the things and we're already getting to do some of the activities we like, like, you know, some things are open with restrictions, right? Like, so maybe you can go to a museum in the part of the country or the world you're in, but you have to wear a mask and only so many people can go at a time. So I try to hold on to those positives like, oh, today I get to go, you know, outside to soccer practice and, and those types of things and just remember it. And the other thing, like Dr. Michelle said, is that you are all doing great and you're way more resilient than we are, um, you know, every day. And you've still Known and developed and learned to how to do all kinds of, you know, cool new things during this pandemic. So just keep that up and then we'll keep working on it alongside you. All right. Great answers. I think that is all we have time for today. So I want to thank everyone for watching and thank all the kids who sent in questions. We got so many great questions. It was really fun to put together the show this week. So we will be back. I'll be back next week at 930 central time to do another Facebook live and this will be available to watch later. So um, you can send it to all the kids in your life so they can watch it too. Um, if you have a question or if your kid does, you can submit it on our question box. It's at our website, dearpandemic.org. And I just want to give you another, give another thank you to Bridges for the deaf and hard of hearing for providing our ASL interpretation and live closed captioning services. If you're using those services, could you please let us know in the comments because that really helps us um, keep them going to know who's using them. And that's all I have. So thanks for joining us. And um, I will see you next week. Until then, stay safe and stay sane.